Support for this episode comes from Modern Football Technology. Modern Football Technology provides real-time opponent tendencies and self-scout while eliminating manual data entry into Huddle, DV Sport, and Exos. If you're tired of tools that are time-consuming to learn and perform inconsistently at best, then we recommend Modern Football for a fresh perspective. Schedule a demo today at teammofo.com to see a battle-tested tool that's proven to perform and deliver value. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code CC10 to receive 10% off your first year. And listen to our recent episode featuring Folsom High School Defensive Coordinator Jordan Ersick to learn more about how the 2023 California State Champion uses modern football to dominate their opponents. You've got to be sharp every day. You can't take any steps backwards. And you've got to make sure there's got to be a system of accountability and checks and balances where kids can't come out and have a bad day and not be held accountable for it. So whether that's through film or it's instant feedback on the field, I think you just have to constantly be on top of it, never get comfortable. Maybe you've got an opponent that's weaker and you feel pretty good about the game and you don't have to stress out. It doesn't mean you can go take bad reps in practice. You've got to take every opportunity you can to get better. And the kids have to understand that. If you create that environment, where they won't settle for anything less than their best, I think you'll be very successful. On today's episode from the archives, we talk with Jason Mons, now the tight ends coach at Arizona State. Having been able to follow him since the beginning of the coaching coordinator podcast and talk to him on a yearly basis, it's been fun to watch his growth as a coach and how he ran an elite high school program at Saguaro High School. In 11 seasons as the head coach at Saguaro, Coach Mons compiled a 123 and 19 record, including a state record six consecutive state championship titles from 2013 to 18, and seven state titles overall. He's a prime example of doing things the right way and having opportunities come from it. In this episode, we talked about how to put wrinkles in that the opponent must take time to prepare for, but aren't really the main focus of what you do. We discussed the role of a leadership council and how they use it to keep a pulse on their team in season and be preemptive in problem solving, and the keys to having consistent success season after season. This short episode is filled with insight into what makes not only a great high school program, but what makes a great football program at any level. Coach Mons has shared a ton of his resources, especially on his offense, and you can find those links in the show notes. Be sure to stay tuned for our Winning Edge takeaways following the interview. What you see on tape is a direct reflection of what you teach and how you teach. Video is important, but if you don't teach well, you're not going to like what you see on your video. First Down Playbook has been helping coaches teach better for 13 years. It allows you to present installs, playbooks, and practice cards in half the time with NFL quality. Coaching tools like video pairing, a player app, practice schedules, and wristband sheets have made First Down Playbook a program management system with everything in one place. If you're in a position of leadership with your football program, receive a free one-week look at First Down Playbook. Call them at 512-814-6158 or visit them on their website or social media. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code COACH24 to receive a $100 discount off the normal $700 First Down Playbook team membership price. Links and the phone number are in the show notes. Coach, we're going to get into it right away and talk about some things that can help coaches right now. And one of the things we talked about before we got going on this podcast is how you force opponents to take some extra time to prepare for you. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. Here in Arizona, when we trade film with our opponents, we usually trade the last three games once we get kind of into the middle part of the season. And what we've tried to do as an offense is make sure we're putting some different looks on film each game. So by the time we get into week four, week five, week six, teams are seeing some funky formations, maybe some unbalanced looks or some different motions, some empty things. We just want to put some new wrinkles in each week. We don't have to do a lot of it. Because, again, we're going to trade the last three games. So we might have done something two weeks ago that we don't work on or do anymore, but it's still on film. They still have to talk about it, knowing that we very well could come out and do it. So we want our future opponents to spend less time 
focusing on the bread and butter and the things that we're going to do every week and maybe just have to take 10, 15 minutes of practice to work on things that really aren't that important to us, but you still have to talk about and you still have to learn how to line up and defend them. What's your process for finding those things that you feel will stress the opponent a little bit and cause them to spend extra time on it? Yeah, I think it comes from film breakdown. Sometimes it might just be something that we saw somebody else do against them. It might be something that we saw watching college football on Saturdays and a coach says, hey, did you see this play? That would be fun to throw that in as one of our wrinkle plays. Or sometimes it's trying to get a personnel matchup. So maybe, hey, we think we can isolate a corner against our X receiver. So if we go quads this week, kind of get into a diamond set, we might be able to do that. And that's not a base play for us. So that would just be a one week, hey, we're going to install this to try to get a matchup on our X. So we're going to try to create some different things like that that aren't part of our base offense or our base packages that we feel that could give us an advantage. Or honestly, sometimes it's, hey, we're going to get this on film. We're going to run an inside zone out of this funky look, and then we're going to make them have to think about all the different things we could do out of it. Now, do you look for that to fit within your system that you've designed already, or do you find yourself having to maybe come up with different names or terminology for it? Yeah, really everything that we do, we try to have it fit into our system. So from our formation system, our empty packages, or our unbalanced stuff, we don't want to have to introduce new concepts. We just want to be able to add some wrinkles and some different looks into the things that we already do. So the terminology shouldn't be anything different for our kids, but it's going to create a completely different look than we've shown on film and than we typically show. I know, Coach, it's important for you to be able to keep the pulse of your team. Obviously, in the off season, it's easier to do those things. You're around the guys all the time. You have the immediacy of the game is not there, so it's easy to keep pulse off season. How do you keep the pulse of your team in season? We've created a thing that we call our leadership council, and typically eight players, usually our four team captains, and then four other players, some representatives from, from, from some of the other class. So we might have two juniors and a sophomore that are part of that council, and I have lunch with them every Wednesday. So we'll come in to my office, and usually I'll go pick up food for everybody or, or we'll have something delivered. And those guys will come in on their lunch break. And we try to keep it loose. We're not game planning. Sometimes I'll put a game film on or sometimes I'll put a replay of a high school game that was on ESPN on my TV and let it run. And we'll eat lunch. We'll talk. We'll hang out. Sometimes it's just having fun and talking to the kids and finding out about what's going on in their life and hearing some funny stories. And sometimes I use that opportunity to find out what's going on with the team and where things are at, how they feel. Are we working them too hard? Are we not working hard enough? And once you build that trust and that relationship with those kids, they'll come to you and that leadership council will come to me and, and they'll let me know some of the things that maybe they're concerned about. It might be some of the decisions that kids are making on the weekend and they say, hey, coach, this kid's doing some things he shouldn't be doing and you should talk to him. And the team's tried to talk to him and he hasn't listened. Different things like that. I think having an open line of communication with those guys and, and an expanded group, not just your four captains, but a little bit of an expanded group so you have some representation from each one of the classes. And we tell our team, hey, if you have a concern, you have something that you think we could do better, go to your leadership council. Go to one of those guys and, and let them know how you're feeling. And those guys, it's their responsibility to bring it to me. It's kind of like our government system within our team. So we've had a lot of success with that. It's a great way to build relationships with your leaders, and it's a great way to also develop your younger leaders. You get those juniors and the sophomore or two that are in that room, and they're spending time. They're talking about making decisions that are best for the team. And so you're kind of prepping that next class of leaders beforehand. Coach, you're taking a lot of information from that so you can make adjustments as necessary. What's the expectation for those players to bring some things back to the team and help build your culture? We just want them to go when we're in the weight room or we're on the field, they're in their position groups, to just keep their ears open. And by no means are they my informants, are they rats. We're very cautious about that. But, you know, I tell them they're an extension of our coaching staff and coaches are leaning on them to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the team. And sometimes I get feedback on us and it's hey maybe the kids are frustrated because this coach in film didn't know the blitz package that we were installing that week the safety coach wasn't on the same page and so it might be hey i've got to pull a coach aside and say hey your kids are concerned because maybe they didn't feel like you put the time in this week to learn or you're confused or you told them the wrong thing and it's not just players ratting out players it's more hey let's find out what's, what's the pulse what are kids thinking how are they feeling are your legs fresh do we need to take our monday and go helmets only and do a lighter practice because our kids feel exhausted because it was a rough game the week before. So I try to find out the pulse of the team and make overall decisions, but I never take it to the team where I say, hey, this kid told me you're doing this, and so I'm calling you out for it. It's, it's not like that. You've got to protect those guys a little bit too. Coach, as we take a look at a game week, one thing that you and I talked about before we got going was that you really wanted to get more out of your Thursdays, so you changed up how you did your Thursdays. 
explain to our listeners exactly how you guys handle Thursday with what you call a mock game. I just finished my fifth year as head coach, and Thursdays are our walkthrough. We go helmets only. It's about an hour and a half, and we typically would go about 30 minutes for special teams and 30 minutes for the defense and 30 minutes for the offense. And every year I was like, man, we're doing a lot of standing around. There's not a good tempo. I don't expect anybody to be killing themselves because we've got the game the next day, but I just didn't like the vibe. I thought kids were messing around. The kids that weren't in, they weren't actively focused. There's a lot of guys on the sidelines screwing around. So I went to my coaches and I said, hey, we've got to – do something different on Thursdays. We've got to be more efficient. We don't need to spend as much time out here, but we've got to get more quality reps and game-like reps. So we created a thing that we call our mock game. It could be a 60 to an 80-play script, and it scripts in and out of all your special teams, offense and defense situations. It usually takes us about 30 to 40 minutes to get through. And so we're just getting guys on and off the field, different special teams, groups, different personnel packages. Of course, my defensive coordinator to put a script together and put a call sheet together for different situations, red zone, third and long, third and short, different things like that. Offensively, for me, kind of forces myself uh, as a play caller to look at the openers I like that week, look at some of our short yarder stuff, look at some of our third and long stuff. So we want to get in and out of that. We want to have our kids on their toes. They don't know if it's going to be third and short, and then we've got a punt, or if it's third and short, we convert, it's first down, and we're switching personnel packages. So the kids on the sideline are more tuned in. And then we've got to have scout teams out there, too. We've got scout guys. They're rotating. So some of the younger kids, they're on and off the field. And we've just found it to be way more productive. I feel better about it. I feel like it's more crisp. And there's not a lot of standing around, not a lot of screwing around. As a head coach, the day before the game, you want to feel like your guys are really dialed. And I think that's done a better job of doing that for us. Well, for sure. And I do think it really gives your players practice at the flow of a game. Because when you look at traditionally how we practice offense, defense, special teams, those usually exist in isolated periods where you're not working the flow of a play series. Guys coming on and off the field, being in all the different situations, etc. I think it gives your players a good feel for what it's going to be the next night as you head into a game. Absolutely. As coaches, we know that some of the biggest hurdles to our team's success can come from off the field. Your team needs support to tackle the endless list of expenses, uniforms, training equipment, travel, and more. But raising that money can feel like a full-time job. Thankfully, there's Vertical Raise. Vertical Raise is the premier online fundraising platform using innovative technology to create the easiest and most efficient system available. Raise more money in less time with a local fundraising coach who works with your team every step of the way to customize the ideal fundraiser. With options for online donations, digital discount cards, premium product sales, and even spirit shops, Vertical Raise has top-of-the-line solutions for every fundraising style. To find out more, visit verticalraise.com and we'll get you connected with an exclusive offer on your first fundraiser. Well, Coach, you guys have certainly done exceptional here over the last four years, and whether you have great players or not, being able to do that year after year is a difficult thing. I think guys who have been there could agree that you have to really have an approach to making sure your team is prepared both physically and mentally for the postseason. What's been the secret for you in being able to play into December every single year here over the last four years? Well, you hit the nail on the head. The first thing, number one, is talent. We're not going to hide behind the fact that we've had great players and we've had a lot of talent come through here. But beyond that, we see every year teams that have talent that get beat by somebody early in the playoffs that probably shouldn't beat them. So I think, number one, it starts with our coaching staff. We've had continuity over the last five years. We've only had a couple coaches that have come and gone, and two of them is because they moved out of state with their family for their job. But we've had a lot of continuity on our coaching staff, guys that have been a part of this, that know the system, that have worked together really well. We've got great relationships amongst our coaches. We try to do some things to foster that. This April, we took a coaching trip. We took 12 guys to Southern California, San Diego State, USC, and UCLA. Spent a week down there, got a vacation rental, and barbecued, and and just spent time together. Because I think we spent so much time together, and it's stressful. You've got to build relationships so that when you get into the thick of it, and maybe your back's against the wall and you face some adversity, you got guys that you care about, that you love, and you trust, and, and you know how to work together. So I think that's been a huge thing for it. And then it's just creating a culture in our program. What are the expectations? What have we done in the past that have allowed us to be successful? And we tell our kids, we're going to be a blue collar school. Everything that we're going to do, we're going to do by working for it. We're going to try to work harder than anybody else in this state. We're going to put in time in the weight room. We're going to run and condition. We're going to watch film. And we want to be able to go home and sleep at night and feel like 
there's not many people that are working harder or working more efficiently than we are. I think you got to be careful with that because sometimes less is more. I talked to some coaches and they didn't give their kids any weeks off during the summer and they were grinding and they're doing all these different camps. And I make sure I give my kids downtime. I want them to be able to rest and recover, recharge their batteries. But when we are here and we are working, we're working hard, we're working efficiently and it's competitive and there's a great atmosphere. That's the other thing we always try to preach to our kids too is any of the kids that are on the team, whether they're a Division One kid that has 15 offers like some of our guys have, or they're the last man off the bench that will probably never play a meaningful down as a starter on the team. If you're here and you're making these sacrifices, you're special, and we're going to treat you that way. And the kids are expected to treat each other that way as well. And so we try to create an environment that's safe for these kids where they're having fun, they feel appreciated, they feel respected, and they feel like they're special. That's what we've had success with. Kids take pride in it. They don't want to be the class that lets the program down. They care about this program. You've had the opportunity to bring your team to the pinnacle to play in that state championship game. And that game in and of itself really can present a lot of challenges. As you head towards what you're striving for, your fifth, how do you best prepare for a game like that? How do you get your players, get your staff, et cetera, to realize that this is still a football game? Yes, it's the one we've strived for all season long, but we have to have an approach that this is just a game. Right. No, I think that's exactly it. You approach it like another game. and there's a reason why you're playing in that game, you know, because you did what you did for the last 13 weeks. And especially in the playoffs, when you're playing other top teams, what did you do in the first three rounds of the playoffs that made you successful? Just do that again. You don't have to change. You don't have to try to out scheme or out think, lean on the things that you do that got you there. And I think that's the role of a head coach is to really try to find your team's identity, make sure as a coaching staff, you understand what your strengths and weaknesses are, and then take advantage of those and play to those. But I think sometimes you see teams that the later it goes in the playoffs with our experience and making four deep runs in a row and winning four in a row, you see some teams maybe are on your radar and say, hey, that's a team that we think is going to probably be on the opposite side of the bracket. And then you see them get beat by somebody and you watch the film, you go, well, man, they, they were doing stuff that they hadn't done all year. They tried to get cute. They tried to out scheme or they thought they might have to not be who they were to beat this team. And on the other side, you're like, man, if they just would have done what they've done all year, they probably would have won that game. So that's the best advice, man, is just do the things that you've done that have made you successful all year long. Don't try to get cute. Don't try to get too smart. Your players, in a stressful moment, you come out of the tunnel and there's a ton of fans and the game's on TV. If you're trying to make your kids think about something that you haven't done all year, it's going to be ugly. So just come out, let them play. Let them play fast. Let them do the things that they're comfortable with that they've been doing all season. And you'd be surprised. You get in the flow of the game and you don't even necessarily feel like you're playing for a state championship until it gets late in the fourth quarter and then it starts becoming a reality. Well, Coach, I've had the opportunity to hear you speak about the things you do in your program from how you build your relationships with players to, you know, the specific things you do on game day. And I know you have all the details covered, but what would be the one thing you would point to the things you do in season that gives your team the winning edge on game day? Man, I think it's just competition. It's competing in practice. It's holding guys accountable. It's, it's not settling for bad reps. We just came off the practice field, and, and we weren't sharp. And it's guys that we know can do it, guys that have proven that they can do it and have done it consistently. But we expect them to do it consistently in practice, too. And so you've got to be sharp every day. You can't take any steps backwards. And you've got to make sure there's got to be a system of accountability and checks and balances where kids can't come out and have a bad day and not be held accountable for it. So whether that's through film or it's instant feedback on the field, I think you just have to constantly be on top of it, never get comfortable. Maybe you've got an opponent that's weaker and you feel pretty good about the game and you don't have to stress out. It doesn't mean you can go take bad reps in practice. You've got to take every opportunity you can to get better, and the kids have to understand that. If you create that environment where they won't settle for anything less than their best, I think you'll be very successful. Coach, I certainly appreciate you taking the time during the season. Best of luck to you and the Sabercats as you continue on your quest for a fifth straight championship. Hey, thanks a lot, Keith. Here are our winning edge takeaways and ideas for implementation. One, get more out of the end of the practice week. Like Coach Mons, it took getting things into a mock game format to have a more productive Thursday session when I was a head high school coach. There's been a lot studied on the idea that Chip Kelly brought forward years ago of no sweat Thursdays and fast Fridays. This has caught on at both the high school and college level. The idea is after two heavy days of practice to have a true walkthrough and as Noel Mazzoni has called it on this podcast, sweep the corners, meaning to go over the details of everything at a slower pace, then come back the day before the game and have a fast mock game-like practice at full speed 
to prime the team to play fast on game day. We have several coaches who have talked about that on the podcast, and I've written an article about it as well. You can find that in the show notes. Two, find ways to keep the pulse of your team during the season. What Coach Mons did to set up a leadership council and then have lunch with them on a weekly basis really allowed him to make good decisions for the team in a number of areas and help them address any issues early before they became problems. This keeps the focus in the right place throughout the season rather than spending time in crisis mode because something does become a problem. Three, steal time from the opponent. Coach Mons and his staff force opponents to game plan for and spend reps on things that they put on game film to act as a red herring and distract the opponent from working on the bread and butter plays. This is something that can be done in every phase of the game. The key was that he kept these within his system, not putting new plays in each week. Good opponents will spend their time preparing, so use this strategy to your advantage. Be sure to check out coachingcoordinator.com for our enhanced show notes for supplemental resources and related episodes. You can sign up for our weekly tip sheet there as well. Do you have ideas you would like to share on the podcast? DM me on Twitter at Coach K Grabowski or email me Keith at coachingcoordinator.com and we'll set something up. If you're enjoying the podcast, please go over to Apple and give us a five-star rating. If you have time, write a review. It helps us with Apple to get our show to other listeners as well and help our great game. 